Welcome back to the Fully Roaming Podcast. My name is Dan. And my name is Marlene. So today we have a special interview to bring you guys. This is something that we've been wanting to do for a while. And this is um, the start of an interview series, even though we've done a couple of interviews in the past. Mm -hmm. But we are doing this in a more orderly fashion now. We have an episode that we just uploaded a week or two weeks ago that's more topic oriented. Mm -hmm. And the goal for this podcast going forward is that we're gonna have one episode that's about topics. Yeah. And then the next episode will be an interview with somebody who's either a full time traveler, uh, lives off the grid, or somebody that's kind of living this nomadic lifestyle that fits this kind of freely roaming concept that we uh, promote on this channel. Yeah, so I think it'll be interesting to hear other people's stories and how their life started on the road or interesting things that they they do and then mix it up with uh, questions that we answer on the podcast so it's not just us talking all the time. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we want to bring more voices yeah. <laughs> into this podcast than just ours. So this one's really special because this is uh, friends of ours that we've known for a couple of years and we first interacted with them only online for like three, four years. Mm -hmm. The initial interaction we had, surprisingly, it was about having cats on the road. And turns out we're experts on <laughs> traveling with cats. Accidental experts. <laughs> yeah, so we, um, as you guys may know or may not know, are 16 years on the road, 14 of those have been with cats. So the first 10, we had our old cat with us, maybe 11, 10 or 11 year, we had our old cat Yoda with us. Mm -hmm. She passed away when we were in Belgium. She was 16 years old and we had two years without. And then a couple years ago, three years ago, we picked up a couple of strays from Europe. So now they've been traveling with us. So this is our friends. You guys probably know who they are if you are active on the, the traveling nomadic overlanding YouTube community. Um, it is Mac and Owen from Bound for Nowhere. They are an amazing couple, very creative. Beautiful they are, photos and videos, and they're so creative, and, and they're really humble and fun to hang out with and talk to. We got to meet them for the first time in 2022 when we came back from Europe. Their journey started years before that, and the reason how we connected, like I said, is through a conversation we had about how to how to travel with cats. However, their content creation really started to blossom during sort of the COVID pandemic. And ironically, during the COVID pandemic, we were in Europe. And while we were in Europe, we were really feeling this longing for community. Mm -hmm. It's a couple of things. I think a lot of people had the same kind of feeling, which is, you know, you had to socially distance, couldn't go places because if you're in Europe, like we were, borders were closed. If you're in America, you couldn't go into Canada. You couldn't go into a lot of countries by plane. So on top of that, we had been in Europe for two and a half years at the time. It just gets a little lonely being an international traveler when you're not yeah. in campgrounds or in popular areas where other tourists would be. And the community there is a little different, right? Mm -hmm. The community there is more either retired people or um, young van life couples. There's not very many families. And how we used to travel in the US, we would meet up with people all the time. And back then it wasn't, it didn't matter if you were a family or if you're just a couple, if you're a single traveler or whatever combination you have. Mm -hmm. we, we met a lot of people and it got to the point where we felt like there was like an overwhelming um, sort of hyper social feeling that we were like overindulging, that we had to like, you know, reel back and find solitude and slow down. But we had the opposite of that and in Europe in Europe and during that time we were sort of indulging on YouTube videos and trying to find other people that were traveling like this to sort of you know give ourselves these this little fix of of um, you know the solitude that we felt when we were in Europe and we couldn't really go anywhere so we came across a lot of their videos I recognized them I remember them and then they were traveling with some friends and in this podcast we talk about 
a lot of that experience that they experienced. And it's fun for us too, because we kind of saw this from, a, from around the world, literally. Other side of the world, we were watching this happening. And since then, we've become friends. In 2022, we came back. We met them in, at Overland Expo West. And a lot of their friends, Chase and Amy, Limber and Carissa, we met them in person, become friends with them as well. So we wanted to bring them on as one of the early interview series podcast mm-hmm. episodes to kind of have them talk about that experience. And also, I think a lot of people who follow them and watch their videos are also very interested in their creative process. And being creative people, we wanted to know, so we kind of dive into a little bit. So I feel like you guys are gonna enjoy this, especially if you kind of have the same types of interest in creating content, in traveling, and also just diving deeper into somebody else's mindset when it comes to living this lifestyle. So it's kind of a long one. We talked to him for a little more than two hours. And I was only able to edit it down to like just under two hours because so much of the information there I think is really nice to hear. It was useful. So I hope you guys find it interesting. So if you guys are here watching this intro for this long, you know how long this video <laughs> or this podcast is. So this is going to be an audio podcast on our, on our podcast feed as well as a YouTube video on our Freely Roaming Podcast YouTube channel. So buckle down, get a coffee, get something to drink, maybe get some popcorn. It's going to be a ride. So you guys will be here for a while. Hope you guys enjoy. And here's our conversation with the great Mac and Owen from Bound for Nowhere. It's so nice to see you all. How are you doing? Hi, we're good. Good. Hold on, Marlene can't hear yet. I can't see and I can't hear. So, <laughs> happy Valentine's normal. Day, guys. Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah, we are Valentine's today. <laughs> yeah, happy Valentine's Day. Hey, Owen. Hello. How are those eyes? They're better. I can see you guys much more oh, clearly. Oh, really? That's Yay! awesome. Yay! Still not 100%, but better. What percent do you think you're at? I would put it probably, let me look around. (laughs) (laughs) I'd say 85%. Okay, turn around, turn around and tell me the time from your TV. Easy, 9.59. Oh, wow, okay, all right. (laughs) Nailed it. I I will say yesterday I posted just like a little update on just like our YouTube community board or whatever. And just was like, hey, you know, our build series, we were hoping to have like roll out a lot sooner after the rig tour, but Owen had laser eye surgery. This is kind of his project that he's championing. And somebody said they were like, if he had PPK, like tell him to be PRK or yeah, PRK, (laughs) tell him to be patient. He said it took him three Mm. months to get the vision that he felt like Mm. he was after. Wow. So three months for like. They Perfect. said a solid three yeah. months. I've and got that's a three month vacation. Yeah. <laughs> I've heard yeah. that from multiple people uh, hmm. too. So it sounds like that's. How's it down SoCal right now? It's Glorious. fine. It's beautiful. Yeah. 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 It's beautiful. It's clearly been raining a lot here. Um, yeah. It's green. It's, it's pretty green. I think that this spring is going to be ridiculous. But mm. I will say that our allergies are already starting oh, yeah. to yeah. ramp up, which means that things are blooming. <laughs> I used to have, I used to have really, I don't know if I told you, I had really bad allergies for several years. Like to the point where every spring, between spring and early summer, like... I would feel like that I wanted to claw my eyeballs out. Yeah, like I'm familiar with these feelings. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, like, there was no reprieve. It was just constant, like, itch to the point where it was pain. Yeah. And literally, like, it messed with my mind. But for some reason, it went away. I'd never, like, I tried to go to the allergist. They did the little, like, prick test with, like, a hundred different things. And they were just like, oh, you're allergic to everything. So I'm like, why do we just do this prick test? (laughs) And the downside of that was that I had to be in L.A. for like six months or something. It's a whole process, the shots. To go through the shots. Oh. So I just ended up not doing it. 
Yeah, you're talking to a girl who, for her first two years of college, had eight shots a week for her. Oh, allergy. wow. So, so you had to do that. Wow. I did have to do it. And it was just like kind of demoralizing. It's like, I am not even 20 years old and I have to go into the doctor three times a week. Yeah. And it wasn't even, it wasn't even going to work for me outside of Southern California, right? Because it's regional. Right. Because it's hyper local. <laughs> yeah. So I need it like zero <laughs> This so, is actually pointless. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But you know what? I don't know what happened. Like, first year in Europe, I still had it. Yeah. The first Second year in Europe just completely disappeared. Like, just. They say that every nothing. seven years. We miss Joshua Tree yeah. in the desert and Baja. I was just telling Marlene I the know. other day. Uh-huh. There's so many Marlene people the other day, like, there. Yeah. So, you know, wouldn't it be so great to be in, like, BLM land in Arizona <laughs> right now? So is. Uh, Central America, not all it's cracked up to be. Central America, okay, so... It's been rough. Camping. Camping <laughs> is tough. Yeah. Right? Like, I can imagine people coming down here, living in an apartment or a house, and just loving it. Mm-hmm. Right? Because you go inside when you want air conditioning. You go mm-hmm. to the beach when you want the beach. And the water is always, like, basically body temperature, like... Wow. Yeah. 80 degrees, 90 degrees, even sometimes if it's really hot. Basically, we should have installed the AC in our van. Yeah, I would do, I would for sure recommend an AC. And have a way to hide the kids so they don't get charged. Well, but even, <laughs> even, yeah, I know. It's expensive for us to camp. Yeah. But so I don't they think do it's charge expensive. by the child? Well, they're adults, so five people. So it'd be 10 oh, bucks a person. Yeah. Would be like 20 bucks, yeah, for a couple's. Fine, but fifty dollars a yeah, night, night for awful. like a toilet. That's so scary. I mean, they do. Tr- <laughs> they do some places. A lot of places let kids camp for free, but they have to be under five. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> like so there's decidedly. It's been a while. It's been a while, it's been a while since they were under five. <laughs> it's gonna be tough to convince people that Luke is five. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know. I know. He's just really big for his age. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. And sassy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> He's really advanced. I don't know if yeah. you understand. Yeah. <laughs> Mens is very inter- interested in him. <laughs> That's a, yeah. Well, I don't know. I think you're kind of born with a high IQ, right? Yeah. So whether I don't know if his IQ is getting any higher. <laughs> it's not linear with age. Yeah, I don't think so. I think it's it's actually an inverse relationship with age. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. All right. You guys get um, serious business now. So All right. Let me. Let, we have, we're in the business of being right. serious. If you guys don't know who we're interviewing today, we have Mac and Owen from Bound for Nowhere. And um, you guys want to say hi? Introduce yeah, yourselves. Hi. That's all you get. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for having us. We're very appreciative. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm Mac. And I'm Owen. Um, People usually think that we're a gay couple, but we're not. Because <laughs> you just assume Max a guy. Huh. Surprise. Oh, you mean by the name. <laughs> okay. <laughs> People always, when they're like, oh, our friends Mac and Owen are coming, they're always really sorely disappointed to find out we're not a gay couple. Oh, wow. Yeah, I, I never thought about that no. before. Because I have a friend from college. Well, actually, she was a roommate. She went by Mac. but Oh, so you know a lady I Mac. know a lady Mac, yeah. Nice. Lady Mac sounds like a special at McDonald's in the, uh, in the summer. <laughs> the dainty <team> Mac. <laughs> <laughs> and Owen? But I guess like we could, oh yeah, I guess you could also yeah. inter- introduce yourself, sorry. I did introduce myself. <laughs> Tell me like, you know, maybe one sentence about you if you have to, you know, if you had a, if you had an elevator pitch about yourself, what would it sound right. like? Ooh. Mac's very good at this. Um, I'm out. This is all you. All right. Well, Mac Owen, we've been traveling for about eight years now in North America, primarily in various vehicles. Right now we're in a four wheel camper and Tundra and we're photographers and filmmakers. It's true. Guilty (laughs) as charged. Um, But yeah, we we left Atlanta. I think that people are really uh, often are surprised to hear that we left the South. We haven't really been back all that much since then. Uh, I think that Owen was born and raised in the South. I am from a military family. 
And I think that we just had this hunger to get to know, it started as just a hunger to get to know the country, just because it felt like as we were entering the working world, we just didn't really know what was going on out there. And we kind of wanted to find a new place to live. This is like right after college. We decided to hit the road inspired by my parents who did a road trip post-college. And we just kind of realized that instead of one particular place, we just really like enjoyed the movement and being able to make the decision about where you wake up and go to bed every day. Um, and that was our favorite part about it. And so we are do now doing like a 2.0 version because like post, we didn't really expect to fall in love with it and ultimately needed to find a way to make it sustainable. So, so that first road trip was in 2012. 2012, we took. Okay. We hit the road again full time for this version, which is funny because like we're in we're in a house right now. Uh, I'm sure we'll get to that, but um, we're in a house too. Right? Yeah, well, <laughs> we're all just a bunch of posers. <laughs> <laughs> that that is the rumor for a lot of people, but you know, I mean, yeah, you know, every once in a while, yeah, you got to make honestly. Winter on the road kind of sucks, and I'm sure we can talk about that too. Yeah. But. Um, yeah, we, uh, just were really stoked to get on the road full time. Um, and we finally did that in, uh, April 19th, uh, 2016 is when we hit the road full time, been moving, moving around ever since. So we did, we did a bit of a deep dive yesterday on your YouTube channel. <laughs> oh no. Did you see a uptick <laughs> on your watch yeah. hours? <laughs> you have probably a solid, like, four cent gain on your revenue <laughs> from what we did yesterday thanks guys really supporting us i, I appreciate it if you go that. on that like geographic chart you'll see costa yeah. rica yeah yeah all of a sudden like, yeah hot. yeah <laughs> we're, costa rica loves us really yeah. and truly it's just dan and marlene <laughs> <laughs> but, the, but the, it's everybody from everywhere in costa rica it's like well, okay we've driven to a few places around here yeah <laughs> So when we were doing this deep dive, like we, you know, we went all the way back to the first video, right? Which is the Vanagon tour. <laughs> was yeah. that the actual first video or were there older videos that are no longer there? That's it. Yeah. We were shooting video with no real purpose. Yeah. You so. did have a purpose. You were doing, almost trying to do, um, like a video and it was a, he wanted to do a second of footage from every oh, single yeah, day right. for cool. a year and i think he made it about six months mm -hmm. um and what he put together was amazing so we were shooting a little bit of footage the thing is like we just like didn't really have cameras i don't know like yeah. owen and i were have always just been um originally we're photo focused we both went to college thinking that we were going to get degrees in photography neither one of us ended up with a degree in photography but um, yeah, so like our connection to that world started in photo and it's just kind of been a, a little bit of a slow adoption, um, on the video side of things. So what, what was that video shot on? Do you remember? Was it your camera that? I think it was Thanks. shot on the a6300. Okay. Cause I thought I saw a glimpse of a, of a APS-C Sony in one yeah. of the shots. Oh, like it was like two cameras. Two cameras inside or going into the the Vanagon Life Center console. Right. Okay. So then if you saw the APS-C, then it would have been an A7R1. Oh, yeah. the original A7R. Yeah. I feel like that camera actually really helped Owen and I fall back in love with digital photography. I think that... So Owen and I, I, I feel like, you know, we're among camera loving friends here. So I think that this is kind of a funny story. Owen and I, we were prepping to go on the road. I was shooting Nikon, he was shooting Canon, and we just could not get on the same page <laughs> about like what we were going to do. And we clearly couldn't take two camera systems. Like you saw our center console was so small, like that yeah. was our, our space to put expensive things. And so we were like, okay, well, we're just going to scrap everything and just go okay, to Sony. Right. Nobody can right. win. Yeah, no compromise. Right? No, it's just you amazing. Can't. <laughs> we're we're yeah, both going to lose. <laughs> yeah, full compromise, which ended up actually being great. But, like, their camera bodies were very small at the yeah. time. And so it was, um, it was kind of like a nice refresh, but it felt like those cameras between – because we got an A6300 and the – a7-1. A7-R1. A7-R1. 
Um, and those cameras like really did help us fall back in love with, cause I think that there was a, a distinct period of time where we weren't really shooting very much it was anymore. that that was tw 2016 when that was shot yeah, i think we got the cameras in 2015 just in preparation but yeah because we wanted to have something nice to capture our travels and i feel like obviously if you're seeing something new and interesting every day it's a really it's very easy and organic to pick up a camera to capture mm -hmm. it and i feel like that organic relationship of having a camera in hand has ultimately led us <laughs> To where we are now <laughs> so had you got um have you guys already been i mean it's far easier to scroll through youtube than instagram but had you guys already been sharing on instagram for a while before that so we yeah we just turned my instagram account into the bound for nowhere one because i just pretty organically and it was really interesting because owen and i we made this decision to get back on the road based off of a previous experience we made the decision to get a van again because we were, I mean, we're kind of like hopeless romantics in, in a lot of ways. And it just felt like the natural choice for an excursion that we were going to be undertaking. And we just kind of were documenting the process more so for our families because everybody knew that that's what we were working to. When I say everybody, like our friends and family knew that that's what we were working towards. And so we were just kind of sharing the process and all of these like, <laughs> random people were coming out of the woodworks and they're like oh this is so cool and then kind of just organically we realized that van life was a thing it wasn't like that's not why we were doing it we were just like this is what we're doing and then we realized it was kind of a thing that was starting to happen and uh it was a pretty organic uh I guess like growth from from there as people started to catch on to the fact that we were preparing to hit, hit the road full time. So the, was the Instagram growth during the Vanagon days? It, I mean, not, not, it hasn't grown since then, but the initial growth. Yeah, I think so. I think that I always kind of realized that it was something that people were intrigued by. Cause like, like I said, very early on, I was like, I don't know who these people are, but they're pretty intrigued by this process. And um, I really enjoyed sharing it. And I also just through sharing our own experience, just kind of realized how empowering it is. If you see other people making radical changes to their life that is like helping them follow a passion, you know, I think that people really enjoy seeing that because I think that ultimately that's what we're all after is living a life that's of our own creation, no matter what that looks like. Cause I don't think that, I don't think that the road is for everybody, but I think that there's a lot of lessons that can be pulled about the tenacity required to follow your own path. Um, and so to me, it was like really important to share that because I realized how much other people were getting out of it. And it made what we were doing feel frankly, less selfish. Um, because I think that to cut ties with, all the relationships and the community that you have in one place to ultimately decide to be residents of nowhere. You know, you stop losing access to like a place where people can come visit you. There was an element that felt very selfish to me about hitting the road. And I think that sharing that process and realizing that people got something out of it took the edge off of that for me personally. Was there for a lot of people that we've met who have chosen to live full time on the road. There's usually a memorable moment that they can trace it back to that was maybe not the only reason, but one of the big reasons why they decided this was the time to do it. Did, did you guys have something like that? Or was it just the cumulative effect of a bunch of different things? I don't think that there was anything that necessarily triggered when, but why definitely. There was a time in 2012 when we were on that initial road trip when we hit the Badlands and being out in the Badlands was the kind of the first time where we felt like we were far away from home. But up, leading up to that point, we were kind of all in areas where there were people, you know, we hadn't really like gotten way out there. Some so sense of familiarity for the whole time leading. And so that was kind of the first time where we had this feeling of being far away from home, being way out there, 
in a wild place. I think we had pulled up, it was sunset, and there were a bunch of bighorn sheep out in the meadow grazing, and then there were the bad ones in the background. Very majestic. Yeah. <laughs> wild and majestic. And I, I think, think we that talked that... about this yes. at some yeah. point, Probably because I, I think we were in the Badlands, too, in 2012. Oh, no way. Oh, yeah, my God. Because we, yeah. drove, we drove across Minnesota? South Dakota, and we ended up in Minnesota. Yeah. Wow. Right? I mean, yes. it's not like it's a small place. <laughs> yeah, it's just, it's a feeling that you never, you never forget. And it's interesting because I was talking to somebody about this recently, just a couple days ago. And it's a feeling that you only have to feel once to know that that is out there waiting for you elsewhere in the world. And I think it's like a, a little bit addicting. That feeling. So was that, was it? For both of you, did you guys both feel that feel that when you were there? Yeah, it was. I would say a life changing mm -hmm. experience. It's definitely an aha moment, and I think that that, like Max said, is kind of that feeling kind of kicked off this whole idea of kind of like always wanting to be put in a similar state of mind. Because I and think that it just feels like every like life and your memories, everything is so rich. And I think that the stark contrast was, you know, we ran out of money on that trip and we had to end it sooner than we wanted to. Granted, we made six, made it six months, so we did just fine. But to like come off the road, it was not like our own desire. So like against our will, and then to insto facto find yourself a couple months later sitting in a desk job that you don't love, working for people you also don't particularly care for. It just was like Hopefully this radical. It was just this <laughs> this radical contrast, and it's just like I know that exists out there. Why would I ever submit right. to this if I know that I can live every day? Theoretically speaking, I can live every day like that. Right. Um, so I think that we just had to experience that. And I think that it's, it was also important for us to experience the direct contrast of that um, to really like light a fire um, in us to make big changes. Because it's still it, from the day that we made the decision to get back on the road again, it took two and a half years. Like it, it's not we're doing this thing and we're leaving tomorrow. You know, yeah. there's so much, we had a house, we had desk jobs, our careers had to change. There was, we needed to purchase a vehicle. The vehicle needed to be ready. Um, there's just so much that prepping and planning because we just wanted to make sure that we didn't have to come off the road against our will again, because like we had already done that. We knew how awful that was. And it was important to us that we made we made an effort to ensure that we were doing things under our own steam going So forward. that was, <clears throat> you guys were in like a small SUV or something, right? Element. Honda, Honda Element. Element. In a tent. In a tent. Oh, so you didn't Six sleep months. inside the Element. Six months in a tent. At one great. point we had our friend with us. <laughs> So there was three, three of us living out of a Honda Element. <laughs> <laughs> there's, a, there's a Honda Element... Uh, like scene. Honda oh, Element yeah. is like a full People on love, like micro camper. Yeah. yeah. It's kind they of a cult. They make pop tops for them. They cut They the make roof. pop tops. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. It's a, it's a Sorry, cult I'm favorite. <laughs> <laughs> this is, a, this is our life these days. Um, <laughs> one eye drop to the next, but yeah. And it's something else actually really interesting happened the next day after we had that feeling in the badlands the campground that we went to it was like one of the the it's kind of at the end of the park and it's this loop and it's down in a, a depression and all of the campsites are just like around this big loop and the tent site or the site next to us a guy had a volkswagen vanigan with a pop top we had seen them before but like had never seen one up close and personal and this crazy storm was coming in the next day. And he's like, oh, do you like want to have beers in my van? Like we can get out of this crazy weather. And we were sitting in his van that the next day. And we were just like, this is this is how you hit the road and you can do it full time. Like this is not much bigger than our element. But the space was 
was great. You had a kitchen, you had a way to store water, a sink. It was just like, okay. So like the light bulb went off yesterday and now we're making the connection so quickly like that this is what we could do it in. Um, the seed was planted almost immediately after, but I think that, yeah, you have to like get away from those moments to have yeah. the contrast to like realize that you need to get back to it. Like so many things could have happened for things to go. This is what I think about all the time. There just needs to be like one tiny difference in your life for your life to be going a whole different direction. Like that guy could have camped somewhere else. He could have left a day early. That rainstorm wouldn't, maybe wouldn't have come. Yeah. He, maybe he would have been broken down and you would have known the reliability of Vanagans <laughs> was not going to work wow, out. Dan, oh, wow. <laughs> right? Because all those pluses that were, that were coming into your head were all about how great it is to have this indoor living space. Right. Right. Yeah, because the contrast these... was that night we crawled into our tent. That storm absolutely pummeled us and yeah. Owen spent... And I spent the entire night holding the walls of our tent up. And I'm sure that, but that <laughs> Honda awful. Element is still on the road, has never had an oil change, and is still charging. Still trucking. <laughs> yeah, my sister actually used it for years and years. Just afterwards. sold it, and like two years, a year and a half ago. Or so. Oh, wow, really? It was, <laughs> no, that's crazy. And it went to a guy who uh, races <laughs> in rallies elements. in in Honda Elements. Like, that's his, that's his car thing? choice. Mm -hmm. I think it's like, a Honda Element thing, like obviously it would lose to. <laughs> okay, okay, all right, oh, okay. right. Only it's a, Honda it, it's a one class, one <laughs> class race. <laughs> wow, yeah. So I, I think at the time too, I think Vanigans were very, very popular. Like, you guys went. I think you guys had a Descend on Bend sticker, right? Because you guys went to a Descend on Bend. Or did we you guys go? Went, we yeah, we went to the first one that we went to. I think was Descend on Bend. Trace. Trace. Okay. Um, yeah, we we did that pretty relatively early on, but I feel like we actually were we got our van like just before they started to get really popular. Yeah, because I think three was, it, been three was sixteen. Yeah. 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 And probably got a we, better deal on it too before. Yeah. It got before too crazy. We paid seven thousand dollars for ours, yeah. which I feel like is is pretty unheard of these days. And it was yeah. in. I mean, it was in good condition. It didn't it, start when we went to go pick it up. <laughs> it was in good condition. I asked for a discount. I mean, were you <laughs> expecting it to, though? I mean, we drove it around the first time, and then we just were like, okay, we'll go get a check. And then, and then we then, came like, back. The next day, we just... came back, and it didn't start. Oh, yeah, and then well. we had to... When we had to go, leave again, and then he fixed it, and then we came back and got well, it. Well, and, and here's you could just like this is just to encapsulate Vanigan ownership. Um, I wanted to drive it to work after we purchased it because I was like, I want that daily reminder mm -hmm. that this is where life is headed. Like, no matter what happens in this building, like, this is my exit strategy, it's only a matter of time. Hmm. And so, you had it for a while when you were still working. We had it for about a year and a half before, okay. a, about a year before leaving. And I wanted to keep, I wanted to drive it to work. Granted, we lived and worked five to seven minutes apart from like our house where we worked. And Ohm was like, you can't drive it until it has had, I think you said 20 unfailed starts. I was able to drive it to work once. <laughs> It reminds me of like, like the yeah, accident exactly. chart. Like, when was the last day our company oh, yeah, had an accident? Right. Yeah, right. Right. OSHA. No, incident. <laughs> Try again. Yeah, OSHA's show, showing up. Right. So, yeah, I mean, theoretically speaking, clearly we didn't read the signs. Yeah. <laughs> so, Van, so do you do you think of do you think of the Vanagon era? Like, do you, I mean, I would assume you have fond memories, right? Because that's sort of the beginning of your second start. And how long did that yeah. last? I think, so it's kind of weird. I think that Depends there was, on who you talk to. I think there was just as much time before the trip with the van as there was during the trip with the van because there was so much time getting it to a place where we thought it would be good to go. Reliable. And then yeah. 
So like we probably had a year and a half before we left and then we probably made it a year and a half before we were like, this thing sucks and we need to go somewhere else. Right. And yeah. The value's been I, going up on these things. That's right. I think I that know, we dropped a fortune into that van. Yeah. So. We lost like a terrifying amount of money on, on that van. And really and truly at the end of the day, that's fine. That's like not a problem. There are endless lessons that were like learned from it. I will say I had more sentimental uh, like love wrapped up in that vehicle because to me, like despite the fact that Owen and I had purchased a house, it just felt like the first home that he and I like really built together, but were also like living the life it felt like we were meant to be living in it. Like it just felt like we had finally gotten to the place that we were meant to be. But like now the time has pa passed, it just is like, it clearly, it wasn't, you know, it was, it was a first attempt of, of ultimately many, um, to get it right. And, you know, we, we missed the mark pretty heavily, but it got us out there. It instilled a lot of tenacity in us because so much went wrong, but every time something went wrong in that vehicle, we just like doubled down. And I think that that kind of thing can scare people off of the road, ultimately, like mm -hmm. causing them to leave the road. Owen and I, that van cost us so much money in breakdowns in that first year and a half that we were in it that like we almost had to come off the road again because it just like let us dry financially. But like we still were just like, no, like this is what we're meant to be doing. Like we have to figure this out. And I think that learning those lessons early on instilled a sense of resiliency in us that ultimately has kept us out here for all of these years. So again, like you said, like it's hard to say that I wish that things had gone any other way because I don't know that we would be here right now if things were as, if things were easy and it felt like we were able to just like hit the ground running and traveling without any any challenges because I think that Owen and I, to a certain degree, like a challenge. Well, and also I'm sure now the challenges don't feel as serious, right? The challenges <laughs> nowadays are, you know, you feel like, okay, we've, we've gotten through worse things before. Right. Right. It's, it's a very different type of challenge now yeah. because it's not, car breakdowns anymore because yeah. like ultimately we learned a lot about being mechanics be by necessity with the van but that's not what i want to do that's not what i want to use my brain space for i don't care <laughs> like what's driving the vehicle i care where the vehicle is taking me so mm -hmm. i'm happy to have that stage behind us and so now the problems and challenges we face are a lot more exciting and less. They're somewhat self-inflicted these days as well. <laughs> <laughs> and those are the kind of challenges that I'm more excited to tackle. Exactly. We'll talk about those self self-inflicting <laughs> challenges later. <laughs> but let's 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 talk about when you decided to sell the van again, and you moved on. Is that when you moved moved on to the Sun Raider? Were you looking for something more capable? Were you looking specifically Toyotas or have, have you, you guys have been on a Toyota platform ever since? Since then, yeah. Yeah, so that was, that was a beast of my own creation, the Sun Raider. I really fell Self-inflicted wound? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I, I was really searching around for a while because I had come to the realization that the van was just not going to be a long-term solution for us. And so yeah. I was all over the internet looking at cool old vehicles that also had four by four. Because, because again, we still love problems. Yeah, you love the vintage vibe. <laughs> exactly. Still love a challenge. And I fell in love with the Sun Raider. Yeah. It was Sun Raiders so are very cool. cool. Yeah. So, yeah. so cool. And I thought that this was going to be perfect. It was four by four. It was a Toyota. All of these things. He comes from a Toyota family, by the way. And okay. I had like all of these like automated like search things to send me notifications as soon as one came up for sale. Yeah, I was gonna say they're, they're not they're easy rare. to find. No, no, no. They're I think super that they rare. made like right around thirty of them. Oh, in four by four specifically, and that okay. was what we did. right because there's and, there's probably others that have been converted since. Correct. Yes. Right? 
but the it's a it's a pretty rare bird and some of them you know don't exist anymore because they crashed or whatever well, and so there was also a recall because of a catastrophic like it error didn't affect the four by four ones any of the 18 foot ones it did not apply to oh, okay hmm. so we came out of canada uh for i don't know we were in canada for a few weeks maybe a month and we didn't have internet when we were in canada because like our cell phone plan didn't work and so we came back into the united states and all of a sudden like boom, one hit there was one hmm. and hmm. max flew out to montana like the next day and yeah i remember it. it had montana plates yeah yeah so yeah, that was that was how we ended up with Sun Raider. I thought that it was gonna be perfect and So you guys was... you guys committed sight on scene. Yeah. We Somewhat. I I had talked we talked to them on the phone. Uh we kind of like told them what we were doing and I think that ultimately they decided to sell it to us because we had intentions of yeah. like breathing new life into it. I think it was only the second owners. Um, of it, and I think it was important to them that it went on to somebody who was going to to care for it because they knew that it was mm -hmm. you know rare. Um, so I flew out and I picked it up. I drove it back, uh, and we needed to get it back across. So Ohm was in Portland. We had to get it across the country because we were going to do the build at my parents' house in Florida. And Owen was you in Portland, Maine, or Oregon? Oregon. Oregon. Okay, so you're going the other That's way. Really you're going the opposite yeah. way. <laughs> So yeah, we had to go that way to pick up Owen and the van because then we were going to drive them both across, back across the country. Oh, I see. Okay, so you went to Canada on the West, West Coast. Coast. Yes. Yeah. And so... You so, flew to um, Montana from Oregon. Yeah. We left our van because the van was going to get shipped back to Florida. And Owen and I, I think we were in Wyoming and the transmission went out in the mm. Sun Raider. So we hadn't made it very far. So it was kind of like the ink, you know, of things to come. Ultimately, it took us nine months to build out. So this uh, is kind of like I'm piecing it together in my mind from our deep dive yesterday. <laughs> so you were in Canada and that's when you guys have your O Canada video, which is the second yes. video, right? Yes. Surfing wow, you, at you Tofino. Right <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, so now the chronicle. The, the chronology yeah, is making sense exactly. to me. You can see that cinematography. <laughs> Actually, I think that what we did was we came back and filmed that tour in Portland because we knew that we were heading in the direction of getting rid of it. And I think mm. that we wanted to have it documented for like what it was for us. But, you know, it would be a tool that would ultimately be used to sell it. Um, yeah, we actually... The thought process was when we got the Sun Raider, we knew we were gonna renovate the entire thing. And we knew that that was what we wanted to film. And so we were like, oh, this is good practice. well, if we film a tour it'll, of the van again, it'll be the first video on our channel and kind of give okay. us some traction for when we start to upload all of these renovations. Yeah. So um, ultimately the Sun Raider build it was it was a long process we were estimating it would take us two months it ultimately took us nine we were living with my parents it just like over the course of that period of time i think that it felt like we had completely lost track of why we were on the road at all because like we had been off of it for so long trying to build this vehicle and i think that we arrived at the end of the build just exhausted and frankly I'm, I'm gonna say like uninspired and we tried to leave we we're like okay we're done we left the wheel fell off on the highway um 45 minutes north of orlando so like we had only been on the road 45 minutes in this thing after the build and the wheel fell off it destroyed a fender it was like this whole ordeal and i felt like at that moment Owen and I kind of came to the realization we did give it one more try to leave in it, but it just felt like we had already had the entire relationship with this vehicle. Like it, the entire, our relationship with it had already run its course at mm -hmm. that period of time. And I think that that kind of four by four is ultimately slightly cosmetic. Like it's just not, it wasn't as capable of as what we were expecting it to be. We had made this big, beautiful thing. 
but like it wasn't as capable, it was slow. It just like, it was so clear that we were gonna be right back into a needy vehicle, that it was just like, mm -hmm. how, how, did we, how did we come this far and not realize this? Yeah. So that's when you fell out of love with vintage vehicles? For a full-time living platform, that is, right? Here, yeah, yeah, here's, exactly. here's the problem. We yeah. still have that affliction, <laughs> um, but we just can't, have come to realize that we can't live out of yeah. them. I mean, I, I get it. You know, we, we came to this conclusion early on ourselves. I'm a Volkswagen guy going pretty far back. I've had a couple of split window buses from the 60s. <gasps> mm. And my last one was sold maybe a year or two before we went on the road. Mm. I just knew that that was not going to, going to work. Even though we only had, we didn't have kids at the time when I sold it. And again, had I decided that this was the vehicle that we're going to flip and turn into a camper, then we would have been Volkswagen people. And then maybe we may not have had kids as early or as many and maybe we just be like hippies on the road still in that Volkswagen. <laughs> See, right? these, Things can these divergent change. pathways, you yeah. never know. Yeah. Gonna... It's the multiverse theory. Yeah, I was yeah. going to say right? these there's are a, There's a Dan in, this, in some universe there. somewhere who's yeah. got dreadlocks and a hippie driving that Volkswagen. Yes. I can still. see it. I love it. <laughs> I mean, I really love the image of the five of you plus the two cats with like hands out the window <laughs> of a split window bus driving yeah. down some... Dirt road. <laughs> it would be cute. I could see it. Mm. Yeah, it would go like four miles an hour. <laughs> We're so right. heavy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I feel so. I, I guess like to 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 bring this all semi full circle. I think that you, you know you you live and you learn. And I think that after hitting the road for the last time in the Sun Raider and being like, this isn't it. We just went back and we were like, we just have to go back to our roots. And we bought a, at the point where we decided to turn around and come back to Florida to sell the Sun Raider, we got on Craigslist that morning. We found a, a great deal on a Tacoma with a bed cap. It was a 2008, relatively low miles, really well maintained. And we were just like, let's just cut it all the way back to the basics. Let's just go all the way back. Let's just make sure that we still want to be on the road. Let's go try to do this trip up into Northeastern Canada and try to get reacquainted with what it is that we're even doing out here. And um, I think that that period was really necessary for us because it gave us the opportunity to like put some miles between kind of a, a tumultuous nine months, fall back in love with being on the road, realize how much of the world is still out there that we want to see and like what we're willing to do to see it. And I think that that was when we started being like, okay, now that we know that we don't want to be building ourselves, like what are our options? Owen had always wanted a four wheel camper. And so on our way up in the Tacoma, we stopped at mainline overland and we took a look at four wheel campers and I also think that, you know, it's a big, expensive vehicle. And for us, like we were in our 20s, I just like never really felt comfortable committing that kind of money to a vehicle and committing that kind of money towards like a home that we can have on the road of that size and capacity. And I think that all of those other experiences kind of galvanize that this is what we want it's okay to spend this kind of money because, you know, we don't, we're not paying a mortgage. We're not renting. Like I'm willing to invest in our life and I'm willing to do it this way. Um, and so it was amazing. Owen and I were able to travel full time for nine months in the Tacoma. We made it all the way up to the tra Trans Labrador Highway. Um, and we were able to travel until the day that our new rig was ready. And I think that that was also a really refreshing thing to like realize that we could still be living the way that we wanted to while our next phase was being built and that we didn't have to be the ones and that there's actually people who are way, whoa, that are way more experienced. <laughs> You're writing your you know, they're, they're, Yeah, there you go. It, I, it I, recognizes that thumbs up. But I really, I, we watched your video on that yesterday and we really liked it. And it was like, we had a similar feeling. So when you guys described that like life changing trip, 
Yeah. Um, yours was into Canada, and we had a similar one in Alaska in 2015. And we also switched to a four wheel after that trip. So it was just like, it was just so There funny. they are, always to pick us up. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's, I the think difference it's is so you guys had, you course, already but... knew you wanted that before you went into Canada, right? Because you were in, you were right. in the Tacoma on your way north. Yeah. So yeah. while you were in Canada, this thing was already ordered and being built. Did you guys we, buy from we, Mainline? Yeah. yeah. We placed our order the day like the day that we took the ferry to Newfoundland, we, it was the last thing that we did. We placed our order for a camper. Um, and then we, we took the ferry to, to Newfoundland and it just felt like this, like call to arms, like this recommitment in what we were doing. And I feel like knowing that something else was in the works while having this like really big, profound experience, um, in a place that we had never been before. Yeah. I don't know. It, I think that we've been, <laughs> We've been riding that high ever since, literally. <laughs> so. <laughs> so we were with you guys in Baja yeah. eating tacos mm -hmm. at Los Cerritos. Mm -hmm. What's the taco place? Barracuda? Barracuda. Barracuda. Yeah, Barracuda. That's, right. that's right. When this woman came to you and said something like, my dad bought if you remember this. the truck, right? <laughs> the Sun Raider. No, was, that who, was, who was the, it? That was the daughter of the family that we purchased the Sun Raider from. Oh, you bought and it from them? I bought it from her parents, okay. and she and her husband honeymooned in the Sun Raider, and it was the last big trip for the Sun Raider before it was sold oh, to us. Wow. Okay. All that carpet. <laughs> so much carpet. <laughs> and I love that part of your video. <laughs> and I think that there was so much. You know, like, we're really proud of what we did with the Sun Raider. I do understand that there's purists out there because they make themselves very known in the comments of our videos that we completely ruined this yeah. vehicle. They, they're like, out there. There's not that many. You know, they okay. just, they're just very loud, right? <laughs> they're just very loud. That just, that's what happens. And, like, ultimately, at the end of the day, I understand to each their own. It's a very different perspective, and none of it is right or wrong. Um, but I think that it made me so happy that they felt like we had done right by the vehicle mm. because I think that, I don't know, like they, I, I really, I really ca cared for her parents. They were very kind people. I stayed, they made me lunch. Like we hung, I hung out for the day before I ultimately left. Like the sale was like, wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. Like right after I arrived and they ended up just like spending the day with them. And it was really important to us that we felt like we had done done right by them and it made me and it was crazy that's like a long lead time to get that validation <laughs> yeah <laughs> right that the family was actually they had sent us an email a couple years uh prior so i had heard from them but okay. to like see her in person and to like see her so excitedly talk about like what we had done uh to the sun raider made me really happy and it's also really great because it's been now it's in a second set of hands after ours the mm. sun raider i've i've actually been a so part of the track sale of it. again we actually know where almost all of our vehicles are um <laughs> to this day the but Tacoma. it just like it makes me happy to know that we gave it another life and that it's still out there traveling with another family and i think that that is so cool i think yeah. that is amazing like that piece of like automotive history is still out on the road doing what it was meant to do mm -hmm. probably the same 22r engine yeah, probably. I mean, there's a reason why some cars are rare. It's because they were not very popular or work very well. That's right. why the manufacturer didn't make that many. Right? Because yeah, the mean, most popular... Four by four for the <laughs> RV. <laughs> yeah, I mean, especially back in 1985. Right? Yeah, that's a, that's, a, that's a newer thing, for sure. Yeah, so I think there's a lot of you know, love for vintage vehicles and a love for people who collect. And there's a lot of people that like rare vehicles, but they all have to know that there's a reason why it's rare. And if you're going to use a rare vehicle for a thing that it was maybe not designed for, you know, there's going to be some pains down the, down the line. Yeah. And I think it's also funny that we were together too, as we were kind of in the final stages of planning our current our current build, um, which, you know, had its own roller coaster of, of emotions, but 
But yeah, it's, there's no, I guess like the moral of the story that like whenever people ask, like there's no perfect rig. Yeah. There's only a rig that's good. It's good for now, but yeah, that's why we've like never really wrapped our identity and our, our vehicles just because your needs change. And so yeah. your tools have to change um, just depending on like where you are in life and what your goals are. And, um, but yeah, we have exactly what we need for ourselves right now and our current plans. And that is a really good feeling. What was, what was harder to watch drive away the sun Raider or Roxanne? Roxanne. I, 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 I think that I was, re- <sighs> I was happy to see the sun Raider go. Um, cause again, it just felt like we had had our entire relationship already right. with that vehicle. Yeah. And I mean, I you weren't like- living in it for very long, so there was no emotional yeah. attachment. Yeah. And I think that the emotional attachment has lessened, like I'm, I'm past having emotional attachments to vehicles at this right. point. Now you're yeah, just a dark, I, I, dark black hole. <laughs> I think though that with, with Roxanne, that was just difficult because the thing was at the end of the day, we loved everything about that truck. Yeah. I think that it served such a good purpose. It still had so much life in it. But there was like so many complex reasons why we needed to build a new one um, that it was just hard to see it go because it felt like we could have kept going for a long time in it. Um, there was nothing that we didn't like about it, essentially. So it, it was more, you know, it was a financial decision. It was a decision in preparation for our international travels. There's been a lot of technological advances that have happened since then in like power and battery capacity. And it just felt like it would have been a disservice to that vehicle to dive in and try to do all of that stuff by retrofitting rather than just starting over from scratch. Because the thing is not everybody needs the amount of power that we need. So like that vehicle is still like perfect for people who don't work as much as we do. (laughs) So. What about, um, okay, so if we go from the top, Stanley is the name of the van again? Stanley was the van. Was that, you, you mentioned, I think, in one of your videos that one of your vehicles was named after a cat? That was, Stanley, yeah, Stanley. was the cat? Stan- or dead cat Stanley. <laughs> <laughs> it is funny. It is funny. But, like, Stanley was, uh, so we had Stanley and Luna at the time. We had two cats. Okay. And we were preparing to go on the road. Luna was very clearly... <laughs> not cut out for it and so we had made arrangements for luna to stay back but stanley was just the chillest like as long as he was with his people like he didn't care that the van was loud he didn't care that like you know he was just he just wanted to be with us and so we had made the decision to bring stanley with us and ultimately he passed away before we hit the road, um, he was a shelter cat. He was found behind a liquor store in Kansas before a snowstorm. He had clearly been abandoned by another family. He had a collar. Um, and we just like didn't really know where he was in his life. There had been some gross underestimates of how old he was. Um, and ultimately, he was way older than we thought him to be. Uh, so unfortunately, he just, yeah, he he passed before we got the chance to leave. So it felt like... In spirit, he still had to come with us. Um, so we named our van Stanley. But you and had honestly, s- the perfect name for that van. <laughs> <laughs> Did you guys have Stanley during the Honda Element trip? Yeah, so both of our cats stayed back with a friend in Atlanta. He very mm-hmm. kindly okay. took and care then, of the cats while they were gone. Um, the Sun Raider was called Amelia. After Amelia Earhart. Okay. And then any other stories besides? I mean, I know that all your truck campers have been named after every every female. Yeah. Power. We like power. Powerful women. Powerful women. I think that. But they just found her airplane apparently. What? Okay, that's another. T- Sorry, okay. we, can get into- <laughs> we can get into that later. But that's yeah. exciting news. Um, yeah, I think that after Stanley was obviously the most sentimental, mm-hmm. uh, we decided to name uh, our Tacoma <clears throat> was Lando Calrissian. Yeah, what's the uh, story behind that? 
I have just no just... idea. I actually think it was my mom's <laughs> idea, but she was like, Lando, because like we're in Orlando, and we're like, no, Lando Calrissian. Ah, uh, okay, okay. Makes yeah, sense. but anyways, I think that, that that one was obviously like not sentimental, not powerful women. Um, but I think that we just, we get lady, badass lady vibes from our, our rigs typically. So, mm -hmm. and it went, just... went on a musical turn after, yeah well after i actually wanted to name roxanne jolene but it was owen's turn to name a rig ah. so <laughs> then it was my turn <laughs> i just feel like jolene is just i'm glad that ultimately we saved i you know that name was saved because i think that it's pretty perfect for our current because like i always joke because like every everybody asks about that truck so you know if you're not careful she'll steal your man <laughs> <laughs> So oh, that's the history like of all the rigs. Something. No, I I love that the that the new rig has a it's a, a little ode to the Sun Raider uh, color yeah, graphics that you put like, on. Yeah, it just felt like the rig that we never. It, it felt like maybe it was just a swing and a miss, and but we loved everything about that vehicle from an aesthetic standpoint, and it just felt like this was the perfect opportunity to pay homage to something that we had such high hopes for. And like, ultimately, I think that this version is what we were looking for back then. Um, it just took us a little longer yeah. to find it. <laughs> and I had always assumed until I watched your video yesterday that the decal on Amelia was already there. But no, you guys designed and put that on on that vehicle, too. There was. It was right. just in grayscale. Right. And then we, okay, we so altered the design the a little bit. Colors. Right. Was it in grayscale or was it so faded that it used to be in color? No, it was actually in grayscale. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure the reasoning, but they did both. They did grayscale and they did the sunset stripes. And I have no idea why some got the gray and some got the colors. Yeah. But we were obviously very jealous of the people that had the color right. ones. <laughs> when well, we some had people the who bought them were big bummers that didn't want <laughs> colors. And the people who are cool yeah, we wanted the like, colors. Gray is just so boring. So yeah. since we had to take it off anyways to repaint, we're like, well, yeah. well, yeah, and I was really surprised because I had, when I saw you like scrubbing the, the, the adhesives off, that tells me, wow, they didn't have to repaint this and the paint looked great. We did repaint it. Oh, you Just did. the camper body, not the body of the yeah, truck. Yeah, okay, the truck yeah. itself was in incredible condition. Yeah, because I remember uh, you scraping the, the, the decals off. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was, uh, I, I had kind of fielded the idea of painting. I thought it would be cool to paint the cab of the truck a color and then have the camper be white. But like, ultimately, like once we got to that phase, we were just like, I swear to God, if something else goes onto the to-do list for this vehicle, like we might die and never get back on the road. So <laughs> it's just like, we need, we just need to get moving. <laughs> yeah. And, um, I remember the video in it where you talked about Owen having to run across the highway to get the tire. And then the Did I include the that guy, the police, the police the, stopped because they thought that... That's, yep, that was in the video. That, that Owen we were was, having a domestic Owen was, uh, dispute. being violent. Yeah. <laughs> well, he was just like, I was on my, like, I was, like, curled up somewhat on the ground sobbing over the broken pieces of the fender mm. that I had so yeah right carefully painted and re-put on and it was just shattered into a ton of pieces and so I was kind of like clutching the broken pieces like <laughs> on the ground and Ohm was just like because like he was obviously going through the exact same thing that I was and just like didn't really even know what to like do or say but apparently it read as a domestic dispute from passing cars. Wow. Um, but ultimately, because we called AAA, we had AAA, um, this isn't going to look great for them. They did not come. They refused to come because we hadn't updated what our vehicle was from the van to this. Uh, and it needed to be RV. And it yeah. needed to be an RV policy. I've heard that before from yeah. other people. Yeah. And so they didn't come. But we had, when the wheel came off, the rotor landed on the pavement and was ground down all the way to the studs. And because it was so close to the ground, we couldn't even get our lift underneath, like our jack underneath it at all. And so we were just like, do we live here now? Do we just like live on the side of the highway? Like what is even going on? And um, thankfully an off-duty roadside assistance guy 
saw who was going the other way, got off at the exit, flipped around and came and found us. And out of the kindness of his heart, helped us. And he was like, don't tell anybody I did this for you. And I was just like, you have now no... you're telling somebody. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He doesn't know who he is. <laughs> Actually, no, that was in your video. Names. I'm not naming companies. But I was just like, truly, I don't know what we would have done yeah. if he wouldn't have pulled over. Because well, he was would able have, to would pull have used those giant off quads tires. to lift the corner up. Right. Yeah, I, I shudder to think what would have happened because my parents were out of town. So there was nobody who could have like come out to help us. It was, you know, it, it, it would have just been a lot harder. Yeah. yeah. It would have taken yeah. more. You have to make a sign, me. stand on the yeah. side of the road. A stellar example of like just kindness from a stranger. I mean, the, the failure, the failure of the, the wheel studs was just coincidental, right? Because it, it could not have failed or not no. failed equally. I mean, that's Our not part of the tightened back on um, right. after leaving the shop that last time. I mean, time. that's not that's not because of a defect in the in the axle. No, right. No. That was just something else entirely. Yeah. Um. So yeah, it was uh, it was certainly a traumatic experience. But again, hard to say that I'm not thankful for those experiences because yeah. ultimately it's led us to where we are now. Well, I mean, cause were you already thinking at the time that this is not the right vehicle? Cause even after that, the, after that incident, you continued to think something's not right. Right. I think there was a little bit of PTSD and so we were always on edge with that one. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think that it was just like it, the feeling right before the wheel came off, because like I was asking, I was like, do you feel that? Like something is not right. And we just, I think that that feeling and seeing what happened, cause like the thing is we were going 75 miles an hour. No, we were not. That car couldn't go 75 okay. miles per hour. <laughs> That's right. Sorry. I'm used to having a Tundra. Cause like kilometers. Can... She meant kilometers. <laughs> yeah. Kilometers we were now. going maybe 55, 60. We... we were on the interstate. It's a yeah. four lane highway. Like we, we could have rolled. Yeah. Truly. We could yeah. have rolled, the tire could have hit somebody. Yeah, we could have caused a horrible accident, but luckily no one was around us because the wheel went all the way from the right side across the highway into the median. Mm -hmm. And luckily no one was around. So yeah, it we just, got really lucky. It just felt really, um, yeah, I don't know. It just like instilled a fear of that vehicle in us that I don't know that we would have ever gotten over. And it was really interesting because when the new owners flew in from Vancouver, Canada, actually, to to test drive the Sun Raider, we were very honest with them. We were yeah. like, you know, all of this stuff has happened. We've changed all of these parts. It doesn't feel stable to us anymore. We're like, and the just video so you know, of the incident is not uploaded yet when they bought it. Was it? I, I doubt it. I doubt it. But we told them everything. So we were yeah, just yeah. like, you all take it out all day. Go do stuff in it. Yeah. Then make the decision on if you're going to buy it. Because like, I want to make sure that, you... yeah, see, <laughs> I want to make sure you feel comfortable in it before you purchase this from us. And they were like, yeah, like we can see what you're saying, but like, it doesn't feel that scary. And I think that that's when Owen and I were like, oh. I yeah. think that we just have PTSD. Yeah, PTSD. Like, and we're it. never going to be able to get over it. Right. Unfortunately. You need it. Yeah, some fresh minds behind it wouldn't feel the same way. Yeah. Yeah. They hadn't been through everything. But, you know, I mean, <laughs> you guys are – so that was like at the end of your build series on YouTube. And you had committed to starting a YouTube channel, right? And that was starting out with buying the Sun Raider and doing the whole refresh on the Sun Raider was the in I don't impetus for it. know that it was ever that, like – decided that we were going to start a YouTube channel. It was more of... Well, the whole idea was to document the Sun Raider build. There wasn't any plans for after the Sun Raider build. And yeah. so, like, there was never any plans to do what we're doing now. It's, we just All thought that the, the community around, like, the Toyota RVs is very tight and very supportive. And yeah. there's a lot of information sharing. And so mm -hmm. we did this and planned this with the whole idea of just kind of sharing as much as we could in mind. Yeah. It was just really important to us that because all that information had so generously been given to us, we just wanted to make sure that that information didn't just like all come to us and then stay with us. It just felt like it was really important to put that information like back out into the world mm -hmm. because the thing is like, there's a ton of campers out there that could get a second lease on life and, 
again, it all comes back to empower, just like weirdly at the core of everything that we have ever done for, for me personally, as far as like life on the road is concerned, everything that we share for me comes back to trying to empower others to like go out into the world and live a life of their own creation. Again, doesn't have to look like what we're doing, but it all kind of just like goes back to that idea of like people should live a life that they're happy with. Right. Go figure that out for and yourself. A lot of that information is applicable for any DIY build, you know, like it's not just specific to the sun Raider. You can apply a lot of that stuff to whatever you're working on. Yeah. Cause like the primary information that I was taking in for that build, like every step of the way was I was watching, I was reading boat blogs, like full time sailing boat blogs mm -hmm. and people who were restoring boats because there were a lot of, there was a lot of fiberglass work. Exactly. Yeah. And there wasn't a lot of people who were working on fiberglass campers at the time. So like all of that information had to come from a completely different industry. And mm -hmm. so to me, it just felt like what I was looking for didn't exist. So it was important that like I made what I was looking for at the, that we made what I was looking for at the time for that information um, and put it back out. Cause clearly there was a need and those videos still, I get questions about Sun Raider build stuff Mm -hmm. all the time and people have asked us how much we would charge to do that for someone and i said there's not enough money in the world there is not enough money <laughs> in this world to make me want to do that again <laughs> but now you're not like a sun raider legend <laughs> did you uh did you see the electrical explanation uh for the sun raider like we did a video just did on the electrical one? i don't know i don't, I don't know. think we watched that one we didn't watch oh, them that's all. really too bad because it's a video after your own heart day i was like i mean i mean if i have to hear the acronym agm <laughs> in that video then I, i'm out <laughs> it's only lithium baby <laughs> that's right that's right yeah. I, i've yeah i've i've graduated <laughs> so at at what point did you guys feel like that you were going to continue then making videos because were you still feeling like you know photography was our thing at the time or had you started gradually I feel like shifting? photography felt like it was our primary thing until like a year and a half ago <laughs> right yeah it's, it's hard for me to remember exactly what the chronological order is of our video archives but from what I remember it took me a long time to finish the Sun Raider series because, a lot of work. you know, like we had moved on at that point. I was like, mm -hmm. do I really want to spend my yeah. life doing, rehashing these old videos? And eventually I did just for the sake of sharing information. And I think that after that, we probably didn't do any videos again until we had been in the... Well, we did a tour of the new truck, the new four-wheel mm -hmm. camper. Oh, we did a we did a tour of Lando before we sold it, like oh, right there right, at the right. end. Yeah, again, we did like building for the, the sake camper. of documenting. Yeah. But yeah. like after, yeah, because like we didn't record footage at all in Canada. I think that we were just so tired. Um, our candle was so burnt from so many different ends uh, at that point. But that's just not the kind of videos In we the were Maritimes playing. in Newfoundland, Labrador. You don't have yep. videos from that. Mm -mm. Yeah, it's just not what we were using video for. We were only using video for tutorial type things. Yeah, right. So it was different and it took until... COVID. No, it was before COVID. We did uh, a short little series about going to SEMA from Colorado mm -hmm. and... Yeah. Um, that was the first time we dove into kind of like a multi travel video like, thing. Yeah. And just kind of documenting our life more than yeah. anything like that. Yeah. Cause I think in the chronological order of things, um, it goes from Lando tour more or less to like Roxanne tour. Yep. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That sounds about right. I think that it has been a very just kind of like following impulse, mm -hmm. uh, which also could be used to describe our life. Um, just like, like, I don't know, like, what are we interested in? Like what? And I think that ultimately we find documenting vehicles to be painfully boring. Yeah. Um, 
I yeah. think that they get views, but they're not. They fun get to make. they get really good views. It's like a really to me, it feels like a cheap shot. <laughs> like, it's a cop out. It, it is. To get it's like views. Fired. It's no, a no, job, no, right? Because at some point, if you if that's what you do, then you're just working another job. No, and and I think that that's great if you're passionate about it. But like at the end of the day, like making videos is hard. Like, mm -hmm. it's a lot of work. It's very time consuming. Like, you want to be excited about what you are making. And excited so, about ultimate... that paycheck. <laughs> and, like, the thing is, like, clearly I'm not motivated by money because I don't yeah. have much of it. But, like, I just, like, for us, it was just, like, what is it that we are interested in doing? Like, what is it that we are interested in capturing? And it feels like that has just kind of been how we have blindly fumbled around to doing what it is that we're doing I mean, now. Yeah. Both of you have design background, photography background and Owen, oh, I specifically you you were always working in motion graphics, which is very video centric to begin with. Right. Right. So I had a lot of background in video, not so much in the capture of live action footage, but just kind of in the graphics and effects of video. And I think that if you were to look at our YouTube catalog through that kind of time it's period the only good thing that has always been present in our videos. Well, I think graphics. that if you looked at it, you would kind of get the feeling that we didn't really have a direction for the YouTube. We were kind of just like throwing a lot of stuff and seeing what stuck. And eventually we started to kind of figure out what we did like. And that's kind of where we're at now. It just well, took a while to find. I'll tell you what I really love. And I talked to Marlene about this is that when you go back to the first Vanagon tour video, you can tell there was a lot of thought put into getting each shot. Right. It wasn't just handheld a guy, you know, like shaking all over the place. Here's the upper cabinet. Here's that. You know, you can tell there was there was thought put into shots and it's not a very long video. But at the same time, short videos are arguably harder to make. Right. For them to be informative. And mm -hmm. also the thing that I love the most is that Mac was the exact same person in that video. <laughs> <laughs> So have I not changed? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, like people think people think YouTube people are like, oh yeah, they're putting on a thing when they're on camera. They're doing this, or they're either they're becoming this other person after they've been on YouTube for a while. But it is really refreshing going back to the video and be like, that is the same person that we're talking to tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, it's, it is interesting because I do think that a lot of people do kind of like have a different persona. I certainly like am not exactly myself. Like, and I think that that comes with comfort too. I'm just yeah. not that comfortable in front of the camera. And I think that Mac is a natural. Max, I cannot relate. I don't know what you're talking <laughs> <Yeah>. about. <laughs> and so I think that she's always like had that ability to just be naturally herself effortlessly. Well, I feel like the thing is like, I know the person who's on the other side of the camera for, and like that's the person that I am communicating with, not yeah. the camera. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't, yeah, sorry, can't relate. Yeah, um, whenever there's a camera on me, I instantly forget what I'm talking about and I just like blank. That's yeah, how I yeah, am too. yeah. <laughs> I just like don't the funny thing is like I just don't think like it just is pure stream of consciousness. <laughs> I mean some of these some of those you know shots almost felt like you knew exactly what to say before it came out of your mouth. Right? Yeah. It's like so you, you know, know these are like these are jokes that she wrote and then now she's <laughs> saying them. <laughs> it blows my mind with Aww. how natural and effortless and yeah just like how quick witted she can be just like spontaneously you're so oh, sweet valentine's Aww. day sweet up words. On valentine's Look at him. <laughs> no that's that's very sweet yeah i don't know it's been it's been really interesting because like obviously we've kind of gotten away from we are the subjects of our videos but like i'm we're, we don't talk to camera much yeah uh, and I, you know, I, I don't, I don't know why that is like for me, I think that I have come to realize that if I am telling a bigger story, I almost never have anything intelligent to add in the moment. I'm very much a like, take it all in, 
ingest it, reflect on it, come back to it. Because we do have some like talking to camera stuff that we just inherently, that just inherently gets recorded, but it's not talking to camera. It's like talking to Owen, like behind the camera or whatever, but I just like don't use it because it's never informed by the whole experience. And so we've kind of gotten away from that. Um, but I look forward to getting back to that within a different, in a different medium, maybe. Cause I think that, you know, I'm kind of quietly working on a project where I can do that um, a little bit more readily because I really do enjoy being in front of the camera, but that's also like not what I want to make yeah. every day. I like the, I like long form storytelling. I like being able to have insight and to be able to slowly parse out the moral of a story. And I can't stand in front of, you know, some pretty place in Baja and like have all of this foresight for things like I just can't can't do that. So just like obviously the nature of what we have made has greatly changed over time. But at what point do you feel like that your YouTube content has evolved to this current format? Because I know that you talked about this, this SEMA short series is kind of something that you made that was the first travel, you know, video. When it's did funny, you okay, this is the first time that I've actually that. considered that to be ultimately a part of the evolution. Cause like, to me, it always started with COVID. Okay. Like what we started making around that time. But I think that you're right. That is the first, it's the first one, first travel um, content. Yeah, we did like, a, and then after that, we tried like a day in the life. And then we did like, I did a, a like traveling things, solo video, a few things here and there, just kind of dabbling in it. And then when COVID happened in that summer, when we went out and traveled, we were just kind of like, at that point, we had started to film things. With it actually, it starts a little bit before that. While we were in lockdown, so we were staying with Carissa, our friends, Carissa and Lindbergh, uh, they're gone dirt and on the internet. Um, we were staying with them in their backyard and it felt like such, you know, I don't think it was lost on any of us that we were living through a historically important time. Obviously we didn't know the nature of what that was or like why it was important or how big or profoundly impactful that time would have been on like ultimately our lives after that. But it just felt like such a strange and unique time. And Owen and I lost all of our work, all of our work when COVID hit. Um, we had like a year's worth of forecasted projects. You know, it was going to be a little photography, a little bit of video, but primarily a lot of design work. And we lost all of our clients. I had been wanting, not all of our clients, but just like all of our work. And Most of I had your income at that point then. Yeah, just right. like it was gone overnight. And I think that that was a very terrifying experience, but to be in an environment with just two other people like it was emotionally and mentally trying it was scary and confusing and we didn't have anything else going on so it was just like well why don't we just like take a little bit of time to capture this because if nothing else i think it's going to be important to us to mm -hmm. have just like a little time capsule from this time and so we recorded a video it was like a day in the life of being in quarantine at Chris and Lindbergh's house. Mm -hmm. And I just kind of wanted to like meditate on what that process had been. And I think it was the first time that I wrote a video, like mm -hmm. sat down, put together like a video by like by myself, I guess. Um, yeah. Up to that point, I think I was doing the writing and Mac was just doing the VO. Mm -hmm. So I decided that I kind of wanted to like tackle that and I really enjoyed the process. And I also realized that I had a fair number of like strong instincts despite, despite the fact that I had never done that before. And I really enjoyed it. I just really loved the idea of telling this bigger story. And I think that for me, it was like kind of a way that I was processing everything that was happening. It just like made me realize like how much it forced me to think about what was going on and how I wanted to deal with it. And so when we ultimately were able to leave quarantine and we decided to try to travel that summer just to do our best, we decided to, you know, link arms with some friends who also travel full time and we were going to try, none of us had a ton of resources that we could carry at any one given time. And it had 
been very clear how important it was to have like an emotional and mental support system. So we all decided just to travel together that summer because again, all of us had lost all of our work. So none of us had to be anywhere at any particular time. It was just this like really unique period in time where no one had any commitments. And so it just felt like, an, again, it just felt like a really important time to capture. And then we didn't know what we were going to do with it. And then after the summer, we realized that we had potentially many, many episodes worth of footage to put together into something. And then that was the first time we approached sponsors about like, hey, we've got this idea. I know we've never done this before. Do you want to like pitch some money our way so we can just spend the time to put this together into something? Um, and that was our first series. And that was Summer Adrift. So, so you had shot everything for the series before we you decided that you were going to yeah, se- like, create a series. Oh, yeah. yeah, it was all over by then. Yeah, it was, I want to say it was like, like that fall or something. I mean, that's like, I, that's that's probably one of the series with the most episodes, right? It is the most. I it think it has 16 episodes. And if you were to put them like front to back all the way through, we're probably talking about three, four hours of stuff. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we can't ever do that again. <laughs> was <laughs> was like, that too much? I mean, what, it was too much. You Alaska don't want to do that also, again. Alaska was also too much. We can never, we can never make a series that big again. Hmm. Um, that series, Alaska in particular, like nearly killed us. Is um, that is that from yeah. from the fact that you just couldn't stop shooting content? Like you just we, ended up with too much content. Yeah, and yeah. I wouldn't say that maybe we were that great at paring down. You know, I think that ultimately, like, you can shoot as much or as little and then decide to make as many or as few videos as you want. Um, right. But I think that at the end of the day, it, again, I'm still glad we did it because I think it was important to hit all over the map. But now we know, like, that end of the spectrum mm-hmm. is much. unsustainable financially, mentally, emotionally. I don't think that the viewership carries through. And in fact, we have since heard from an ad agency who has done actual research on this and five episodes, 20 minutes Mm. or less. That's what people have a bandwidth for. But but that's just like a stuff. Like we did eight this past year. I mean, it's, it's, eight was great. It's a matter of how, what the audience is, right? Like your, your most ardent subscribers will never get enough. Right. Yeah. Right. But we're talking about the 80, 20 rule, 80% of them only want to see five and they want to be able to get through it in a reasonable amount of time to have yeah. some kind of closure so they five can move on to something episodes. else. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's so kind yeah, of how I, TV has become just, too. Yeah. Now TV yeah. series are much shorter. Yep. Yeah. So I don't know. It's, it's been kind of interesting. And like, ultimately I don't think the evolution is clearly not over. And like, I can tell you like we're in the midst of an evolution right now in the way that we're making every single time now when I sit down to write, because I now have kind of like a couple years of experience at this rate, which is kind of wild to say, because I still feel like I have no idea what I'm doing. Um, but I think that it's really been fun to figure out how to hone in the process. I really enjoy perfecting how we work and seeing how that ultimately like ends up representing itself in the finished product. Uh, you had talked about, I think last year when we were hanging out, you had talked about that you had revamped the way you write. And I've done it again this week. (laughs) Wow. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So and can you tell us about the evolution? Like you don't have yeah. to go into any detail that you're not There's comfortable you sharing, but oh. kind of tell us about okay. how did you do it at the beginning? Why that didn't work? And what was yeah. the last shift that made it work better? And then this week, what happened? What are we now? doing now? Yeah. Okay. So um, this is going to give you like some real deep insight into how Mac thinks. Okay. <laughs> so... Uh, <laughs> Um, writing the Alaska series, as I mentioned, nearly killed us, killed each of us separately and together from like a whole bunch of different perspectives. Um, but people I, love that series though, right? It, yeah. Is that one and of it's more really, popular ones? Yeah. yeah. I think that was kind of the first one that captured 
a larger audience. Yeah. And, and I think that when people hear that, they're like, oh, but I love it. And I'm like not saying that I am not stoked. Like, I still feel like that series slaps. I feel like we've progressed mm -hmm. pretty far from there. You know, I can see notable improvement. That's great. But I'm still super proud of what we made. And it was just a period of time where I felt the most beat up I had ever felt in my entire life from work but also felt the most inspired I had ever felt from work. So it was just this like weird catch 22 where it was like something is working, but there's also a lot that's not working. What's well, a big so, learning experience. Right? It is the, uh, much right. like so much. We just, um, so to give you a little bit of insight, we realized that we were working in a massive financial deficit. We were actively losing like a catastrophic amount of money, like spending the amount of time that we did making each of these episodes. So that's a really natural segue into telling you that it would take me almost two weeks to write a single episode mm -hmm. because I would get in front of my computer and because I'm not trained in this, just kind of figuring it out as I go, I have had some pretty chronic issues with uh, imposter syndrome in the past and it would rear its ugly head every single time I would sit down in front of the computer to write. And I would sit there all day, stare at a blank sheet of paper on my screen and just go through all of the reasons why I shouldn't be doing what I was doing and that I wasn't qualified. I, what makes me think that I have the ability to do this? Like it was a, it was just like a, it was a dark time. Uh, and I think that ultimately that stretched into multiple facets of life. And I think that it didn't, dawn on me until after that series was over that I have the power to change how I go about thinking about work, how I actually execute it. Cause at the end of the day, as long as the finished product goes out the door, it doesn't matter how it gets made. So when I sat down to start writing, um, a long time coming, which is our Midwest series, I went into it with the objective of finding a better way because I knew that I loved the finished product. I knew I loved storytelling. I love everything about it, but I hated writing because it just felt like a time where I would rip myself limb for limb. And so I decided to sit down and I was just like, okay, what can I do right now to just like start getting stuff on the paper? So instead of just like, free form, going through the footage, writing, like, so I was just bouncing between, that was what I was doing originally, bouncing between footage and a blank piece of paper. I wasn't gathering any notes. I wasn't like making an outline for what I wanted. The st so I was just kind of like writing every episode from beginning to end, next episode, beginning to end, next episode, beginning to end. So then when a long time coming came, it was like, okay, what is the moral of the story I'm trying to tell for this series? Great. This is the moral of the series. What plot points do I need to hit across the series to ultimately get me at that finishing point, the payoff of the series? And so Owen and I started sitting down before I would write and we would kind of gather all of these ideas that we had, like things that came up for us that kind of ultimately led to where we were at the end of the series. And I would get all of those things in one place. So all of those notes between us, our experiences, what we're wanting, the, like ultimately the story to tell for the series. Then I would go into my notes. I would gather all of my notes from those periods of time and I would start to break it out into episodes. So it'd be like, okay, in this episode, I need to hit one plot point to start moving the needle towards the moral of the story. And I would go through my list and I'd be like, okay, I have footage where I can tell this plot point. Great. It's going to be roughly here in the middle of the episode. So it's just kind of, uh, I guess the best way to like put it, it felt like I just started instead of, I was like writing this like corn on the cob. Like you do a pass, you get a little bit more clarity. You do another pass, you get a little bit more. And so then now what I'm doing is I have started breaking. Um, so I'm working on a single video that is a short, like a short mini doc, if you will. And I've like, now I'm breaking it into scenes. And before the scene with like my notes and everything, 
I write, what is the point of the scene? Like, how is this getting us closer to this finish? And all of these notes are real. Nobody ever sees them except for me, Owen, and the editor. But it's important that everybody's on the same page about like, what is the purpose of this footage? Like, what is this serving? What does it need to do to move us closer to this finished result? And so really and truly, it's just a matter of like gathering an insane amount of notes and then like stream of consciousness ideas for like things that could be said. And then when you go to sit down and write, you have all of these details at your disposal and it's super easy to write because it's all right there in one place and then it comes really naturally. So it's just this like kind of like, do a pass, get a little more, do a pass, get a get a little more clarity and tell you are ultimately writing. Um, but I think that just like getting your notes, getting your ideas clear, and then kind of tracking them on the storyline is the best way for me personally to write. And it's really fun to kind of like gather all these ideas, put them in one place and then grow a story out of it. What do you, what do you call this type of writing? Are you, are you, I have no you, idea. I mean, <laughs> The, but but the type of content you guys make are sort of documentary style filmmaking because you're not going out there with the script already written before you shoot, right? You're going out there shooting first. Yeah. Right? And then you're and coming we, back with what you have and seeing what story can I make from what we shot. Right. Precisely. Yeah. Um, and it's really funny because a lot of times like we have to gather. No, not a lot of times. We always have to gather funding to ensure that we can like pay and afford to make something. Yeah. And so we have to put these pitches. We're like, oh, we're going to this area. And this is the moral of what we think the story will be. Right. And then so there's always a note. Like, this time. is subject to change. Subject to change <laughs> because like at the end of the day, it's important to us that we're telling the story of what actually happened. Because okay. um, we talked about this a little bit changed. with A Long yeah. Time Coming, that you were hoping <laughs> that there was a payoff at, at, at Isle Royal. Well, the good news is, no matter what, it was going to be a payoff because... Yeah, right, right. But it, it was, was different than you had imagined. Yeah, it was yeah. this destination that we had been looking forward to. We had always wanted to go. It was like this big dream destination. And then to get there and realize, like, <clears throat> low-key, like, a couple days worth of depression getting there and realizing that that experience was not playing out how you envisioned, I was just like, mm -hmm. am I allowed to swear? Yes. <laughs> I mean... <laughs> I was Kids just like, are not going to be yeah. listening to this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just like, because ha we had this idea going into it, and we're like, oh, it's going to be great. But, like, ultimately, what we got out of it was so much better than that. Like, yeah. you can have all of these grand ideas, and that's great and all, but, like, rarely is it ever going to pan out that way. And so yeah. it's not, like, what you get. It's how you respond to these experiences that aren't as you planned that really makes the experience. So, yeah, I think it's important with these types of experiences and it's kind of like a dangerous road to plan ahead and like have an idea of what you want the moral and story to be ahead of time. It's a dangerous thing because if you aren't open-minded to changing that or it could really color or like your yeah being able yeah. to adapt on the fly then yeah all of a sudden it'll show on it's, camera yeah and you could be like really bummed out because it's not what you wanted right so you yeah. have to like it's a weird balance of like going in with certain expectations but also being willing to completely drop them so the yeah. challenge i guess now is this chicken or the egg kind of thing when it comes to funding like how do you get funding without a story that you can present and pitch, but then how yeah. do you get them to fund you <laughs> yeah. knowing that they may not get exactly what they paid for? You're asking all the questions that I ask myself every single time we pitch a series. <laughs> um, well, I think that the important thing that we have going for us now is a portfolio yeah. of previous work that just goes like, yeah, this didn't exactly pan out how we expected it to, yeah. but we still ended up with a product that right. I think everyone is happy and the with. Client yeah, the client was happy. The great, so yeah, the great news is yours. everybody seems to always be stoked. And I think that what's really different about us is like the way that sponsors are involved in what we make. Because like, they aren't really. <laughs> No. They, you know, they decide to help fund our project. There's usually like two tiers worth of involvement that they can 
uh, get in on the project. But really and truly what it encompasses is they get their logo in front of our video. Mm -hmm. And that's about it. I mean, but at the end of the really day, it's eyeballs on their brand, right? Yeah. And we only work with people. We love to work with people that are very organically omnipresent in our life because it's a very... Right. Um, easy to promote them. It's yeah. easy to promote because like we love them. They take re really great care of us. We love yeah. what they have. It makes what we do possible. You know, it's really easy, but also I'm not here to sell anybody on anything. I think that we're here to sell people on the idea of going out into the world and having these experiences and you know along the way they will need some gear and i would hope that they would see that we've had a great experience with those things so to, for us it's like a little bit yeah like we can't ask for crazy amounts of money like some people can because we are mm -hmm. not giving them mm -hmm. as much freedom you gotta like give up you got to give up more to get more and, and we're not willing to, to yeah. do that with our personal work because I think it's really important that it remains true to what it's meant to be. Yeah. Um, we're not trying to like pull the wool over anyone's eyes, our brand partners or the viewers. But um, I don't know. I think that we feel really lucky to be in the position that we're in. It's never lost on us. Um, and we're very thankful that the brands that we work with are incredibly trusting. Um of us when we're like, yeah, like this is our idea, but like, as you know, like it probably will ultimately be this. Um, but the cool thing was with the Baja series was I gave them a moral of the story that I knew would not change, but I knew that that wouldn't mm -hmm. be the only focus of the series because our work greatly deals with the mental and emotional growth that comes from travel. Um, but like the moral that I pitched for that one was international travel for those who are in the United States is extremely accessible if you're willing to have an open mind and go to Mexico. And so like that was kind of the moral that I knew would be able to remain throughout the series. But then I knew that I would be mixing in this bigger idea that um, Owen and I are preparing to go international. And this was kind of us like testing, testing those waters close to home in an accessible way. How do you feel about your preparation for international travel at this point? Fantastic segue. I see what you did there. <laughs> <sighs> so I'm going to be honest. It's funny because there's other people who are also planning to do the Pan Am right now that we have been in communication with. And it's really funny to see the spectrum of the level of planning that people yeah. do. Yeah. Um, We're on the... We're on the low end of that spectrum. Okay, so I was going to say, I have a feeling that we sit in the same position as you all. I think that we try and cover the big important things like shipping the vehicle. Big broad strokes. <laughs> but yeah. um, we usually leave the finer details for spontaneity. You know, there's like some big things like, oh yeah, we're going to go to Patagonia. But... <laughs> It's yeah. a big place. <laughs> People keep asking about our route, and we're like, I don't know. You can't. Uh, <laughs> we, uh, that direction. Yeah. yeah. We talk oh. to a lot of people, too, that are chronic over planners. Oh, and I think it feels like that they're just setting themselves up for disappointment. And maybe it's not too, it's not unlike having expectations for a trip that you may shoot a series for, like having Aya Royal to be a disappointment, you know, you, because you had anticipated a yeah. certain outcome. And also just with border crossings, you know, we know that people that are chronically over planning, having to make sure everything is documented, planned. Sure, you want to have a certain level of that, but at the same time, there is such thing as being over prepared for a border because you, you psych yourself out at what, things can go wrong that will probably not go wrong and chances are things will go smoother than these people planned but they go into it with such trepidation because they over planned it's really it's interesting because like i have wondered what the dip because like i'm very familiar with the type of person that you are describing and i have spent a fair bit of time like really trying to figure out like 
what the difference is and like why our approaches are so different. First of all, different strokes for different folks. Obviously yeah. mm -hmm. that's like clear and cut thing. But the other thing is at this rate, we've been on the road for a long time. So have you all. This is what life looks like for us. There are so many unknowns all the time and we are so comfortable with like allowing those to be there because we have lived with them for so long. I think that when people are preparing for a big international trip, if they have, they're going from a home environment to doing the Pan Am, there is just this level of discomfort with the unknown and that is completely natural we have just already worked through that like that is just like not really a thing for us anymore because like the really and truly like what is happening is we're going to do exactly what we do here the way we do it here over there that's the only difference we're doing it in just a different country so like yeah there's some some important like shipping the vehicle border crossings but like the other thing is like we have nothing but eight years of experience in knowing that like we can overcome a lot of really challenging setbacks. And we are just the type of people that like when those things rear their ugly head, we'll deal with them. But I'm not going to spend my life worrying about them now because it's not going to change the outcome. Ultimately, it's, ra it's just like you deal with them as they come and then we move on. And I think not doing this in the Sun Raider or Vanagon is a is a big head start compared to mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, you know some I of these agree. other obstacles that you that that you, that you guys have had to overcome. Um, Definitely some peace of mind. Yeah, yeah right. And but we just like have a, we just have our ways of traveling. Like we just have been doing this for a long time, and so we're just yeah doing that over there. <laughs> <laughs> it's like that's it feels kind of simple to me but i do understand it's a big it's a big difference and maybe we should act like it a little bit more <laughs> <laughs> i mean you're still six plus months from heading out right yeah. so i think if you were to get into too much nitty-gritty details it's too early things will change yeah, yeah. if nothing also, else we're not sure what we're doing like tomorrow let yeah. alone like what's happening in six months. Exactly. So. Right. Did I jump on your questions? Yeah, you took my question. That's fine. I'm used to it. <laughs> <laughs> but you did have some like rapid fire questions for oh, okay. the end here. Okay. I know. Uh, rapid fire? They're not necessarily well, not rapid, rapid fire, fire. But Dan had some creative but, questions. You know, okay. these are questions that hopefully that people haven't asked you a million times, at least not in this particular format. Okay. Okay. Because we're longtime travelers, yes. so we know some of these questions are not, there's no answers for them. But if phrased okay. slightly differently, then it could be interesting, right? Oh, wow. I'm sorry. Okay. I'm so curious. <laughs> so the, so the, the, the original form of this question is like, where is your favorite place? But we know that doesn't exist. Right. So yep. what I want to know is if you were to be able to pick three places, once your traveling days are done, you could pick three places to hop from every year. What would those three places be? Baja for sure. Baja forever and always. Um, I also really like Tofino, uh, which is Vancouver Island. Cute surf town. Okay, winter, summer. Yeah, I would probably not say Tofino. I'd probably just go up to Alaska. Mm, yeah, he's right. He's right. And then it would probably We're in Alaska. Be... Alaska is really big. I really like Homer. Homer. Mm. I love Homer. Yeah. And Juno. Juno's amazing. Just mm. uh, a little bit little difficult. Yeah, yeah, for the sake of, of being landlocked. Yeah, I would say probably... That's a tough one, but Homer feels solid. Yeah. I do love the sandstone deserts of Utah. Mm -hmm. I was going to say Newfoundland, but Newfoundland feels slightly redundant with Alaska. I would say not completely uh, the same, but to yeah. get something more, get more variety. Escalante, Utah. Let's put that as the third okay. one. Okay. You actually own a piece of land in each of these places. What do you yeah, put on it? I, I, I would. Oh, what are we putting on it? Yeah. What are you putting on these these three plots of land? I would love an A-frame in Alaska. Okay. 
right? I think that in Baja, you have to go with just like a traditional kind of um, brutalist cement slash like. <laughs> yeah. so but a palapa, something. a big palapa. You need a next palapa. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Gotta have okay. a palapa for the friends passing through town. Yeah. Um, and then I think in Utah, I would love to put kind of like a, there, I can actually tell you the exact company name. Um, we hope to one day own, a, they're called Backcountry Cabins. It's a environmentally sustainable uh, kind of like build on site mm. cabin. But they're, I would say that they have like a Nordic, kind of like a Nordic. It's like a kit? They sell you a yeah. kit or is it a prefab or? It's a prefab. prefab. They prefab. build it there. They build the pieces there. Then they um, they put it up. They're really beautiful. And then you get to finish them out. Um, we've already got like a floor plan picked out. Wow. Um, so yeah, that's something that we really do hope to own someday. Um, so that's I for Utah. Be, I think it would be really beautiful in Utah because they're okay. black primarily. I think the black up against the the red, the red rocks. Yeah. Rock would be yeah. really beautiful. Escalante. We got a great photo of Luca in Escalante. We'll send you another time. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Uh, let's see. If if the four of us were to start a business, <gasps> what would we do? I feel like <laughs> I have so many ideas. It can't, okay, hold on, hold on. Let, let me let me add a little addendum to that. It can't be something that we already do. So we can't open a French fry stand on a remote beach in Boston. Oh, okay, yeah. Oh, oh. Okay. All right. That's why we have a big palapa. <laughs> you enjoying it? We got a, we got a yeah, big your Cabo. I feel like that's what that's what we're is that what we're doing? I think that's what yeah. we're doing. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think you yeah. nailed it. I think I think so. <laughs> right. Onion rings and onion rings. Yeah. Onion yeah. Ring. Oh, it, we'll have to do it at Nine Palms. Yeah, yeah. So the, yeah. just like a, a fry shack of some description. Mm, and we're gonna buy out. The entire inventory of Costco. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I can see it in our future. Cool. I like that. Um, Thank you. Who inspires your current work and who inspires your current travels? Present company excluded. Fantastic question. I feel like uh, even though present company is not included, I do feel like it needs to be publicly known that the two of you and all of you, the five plus cats, have been a big inspiration for us for a really long time. Well, I know so, that I know that twin is a big inspiration for Boo. So yes, yeah. definitely. I think it's more like Toby. Yeah. Oh, oh, okay. 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 All right. Well, I'm, I'm not going to tell twin that just because she's <laughs> yeah. kind of sitting on her high horse right now. <laughs> um, but you know, I think that our immediate friend group is always a huge inspiration to us. We're very lucky that our immediate friend group of Chris and Lindbergh of Gone Dirt and Chase and Amy of Tight Loops Fly and then Peter and Truthy of Holiday at Sea. They're all just like really incredibly creative people. Um, most of us work in the art and you know, media worlds. Everybody except for Peter actually. Um, but like... <laughs> Sorry, Peter. Peter. <laughs> but like, they're just like, they're incredibly accomplished travelers in their own right. They did the Pan Am in a Volkswagen van again. Um, just like accomplished travelers, very talented, creative people. And it's always very, um, very special to share kind of what we have in the works, to get feedback and insight from each other. Um, aside from that, I, I'm trying to think like outside inspiration. Yeah, I mean, I take a lot of inspiration from different illustrators and designers because, you know, I, I kind of live and work in that world. And it's always something I'm thinking about for our series and videos is like, what kind of graphics can we make and things like that. So, yeah, because if people don't know this, you guys work with designers, illustrators for a lot of your intros, right? Yeah. Yeah. I feel like, you know, like it's, it all started in the Alaska series where a former coworker before we left on the road, we had always had this idea to work together on a passion project. And that kind of felt like the first time, you know, like we were never able to just like make time to do something that wasn't paid. And so we finally had some money that I could throw at him to like help illustrate this stuff, even though it wasn't like a ton. And I think that that kind of like set us down this path of like <laughs> committing to yeah. trying to make a nice intro series every single time and working with different designers and playing with different styles and things like that. So I think that 
I still take a lot of inspiration from the design world outside of, you know, travel and things like that. I think that anyone that's got those kinds of skills that I don't have just, yeah, yeah, it really inspires me and it gets me excited to work with them. Um, And I feel like I can't, we can't move past this phase. Uh, I have before, maybe before we get, get to that. um, I watch a lot of uh, storytelling like technical breakdowns of modern movies. Um, And I really enjoy understanding the mechanics of what makes really good storytelling. Um, That's something that's super inspiring to me. It's something that I really seek out. Uh, It's something that I try to, you know, do the best to implement into our work. Cause I think that sometimes documentarian pieces, I think that maybe this is a little bit of a hot take, but I feel like sometimes like documentarian pieces lack like really deep quality storytelling. Cause they're trying to like tell us, I, like a lot of times you just have these pieces that you have and you don't get to choose like what media you have at your disposal to tell these stories. But I feel like there's ways to do it. You just have to be kind of creative with it. Um, so that's like a big, that's like my personal vendetta is to bring just like really impactful thought out storytelling, um, and storytelling mechanics into documentarian pieces. Um, but my biggest personal inspiration is, um, both my parents and my grandparents, uh, my grandparents were very prolific travelers, very talented photographer, whoa, (laughs) very talented photographers. Um, I don't know what happened there. And I have always been inspired by their travels for as long as I can remember. Um, But I very recently have started uh, diving into, I have become the caretaker of their entire body of photos. And um, it's been really cool to see. I feel like that needs its own Instagram account. (laughs) You know, it's funny that you say that. I've kind of thought about that. But like, also, I need to hire help. I can barely post on our own Instagram. (laughs) (laughs) But um, I just have found like the most incredible photos of the most incredible remote places and the time in which like the era in which they were traveling to these places is pretty remarkable. Um, Yeah. They were really ahead of their time yeah. and I, I've always taken so much inspiration from them and I look forward to one day telling their story in some way because I do intend to. So I think people don't appreciate how much effort it was to do it back then. Yeah. Cause how much easier it is to do all this stuff now. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And just like the way that they ingested the world and then the way that it was kind of passed down to me, I also found to be very inspiring. It was like very important to them to like instill the idea that we're citizens of the world less so than one country. And it's our duty to understand that everybody operates differently and our differences are something to be celebrated. I think that that idea also was just really ahead of their time. And I I just think that They were doing something really beautiful and capturing beautiful images, meeting a lot of really lovely people that they're still in contact with to this day all over the world. Cool. Your grandparents are still around. They are. Yeah? They are. Very lucky. Yeah. So it's really cool to, they actually don't, there's unfortunately um, some dementia and Alzheimer's in the family. And so uh, they're definitely, like, kind of going through that themselves Mm -hmm. and, uh, I will be sharing what I'm doing with them in some way, shape or form at some point. Uh, I just kind of want to get it to a point where I want to be able to present a body of their work back to themselves. Do you feel Um, like they're still together enough to get them on camera for some interviews? No, no, it's too hard. Um, Sadly, that was something that I was planning on doing when I went home for the holidays this Mm -hmm. year. And um, unfortunately, there my grandmother had a mental break of some description. We think it was stroke, a, a series of strokes or seizures. Seizures. Sorry. Yeah, I can never remember if it was strokes or seizures, but I think it was it was seizures. That's rough. Um, that took a great deal of her ability to communicate um, mm. for any extended period of time. Um, and of course, you know, this was like two months. Before the holidays. Were you close with them as a kid? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. 
Definitely. Um, despite being, yeah, despite being a military it. family and being on the move all the time, um, I feel like we were as close as could possibly as could possibly be. They were yeah. in our lives. They always came every every place we moved to. They they came to. Um, so yeah, we were super close and I feel lucky to, as the oldest grandchild, I have the biggest, like, I would say that I have the best relationship with them and have probably gleamed the most from my relationship with them. Um, I do, you know, it goes without saying that I have some regret that I didn't kind of come to this realization that I wanted to capture them sooner, mm -hmm. um, because I feel like I just missed my opportunity mm. yeah um, i've had i have similar regrets about my grandparents they have yeah. a lifetime of stories that we'll just never know yeah that's a that's a tough pill to swallow yeah as somebody who's actively trying to choke that one down <laughs> <laughs> yeah i feel you i feel you but i i feel lucky to have the photos that i do so yeah. All is not lost. Would, would you ever create anything that's n fictional narrative? I cannot tell you how badly I want to do that. <laughs> yeah. I, I feel like there is not enough time. Yeah. Like there's on, too much documentary on planet stuff Earth for, for me. Um, I mean, you yeah. would have to consciously switch and not yeah. put your effort into the stuff that you're doing now. Yeah. And the thing is, like, ulti <laughs> The biggest, like the biggest thing, like holding me back right now, is honestly, is funding. It will always be funding. Um, I have, I have an idea for a screenplay that I would really like to write, and it's a story based on our first couple of weeks on the road that I think would be really fun to do, kind of like indie film, mm -hmm. but like actors, actresses. I think it would be really fun. Um, I really have an aspiration to write and work with an animator to do a full animated short. Um, obviously you would be involved in that. Yeah. So anyway, <laughs> I have a lot of, like, I have a lot of goals. It was like right here. <laughs> I also really want to do a music video. I really love music videos. I think that the, mm. the type of storytelling that's employed in music videos is really cool. And I'm a really big fan. I have so many ideas and just not enough time or money to make them all at the moment. All right, guys, throw some money in. We gotta, <laughs> we gotta start a GoFundMe or something. Yeah, well, we're we're working on, we're working on something that hopefully will. I just want to make money so I can spend it making other things. <laughs> <laughs> well, do you guys have any near-term projects that you want to talk about before we wrap up? Something I think that we only promote. have one that we can legally talk about. <laughs> okay. Okay. And it is uh, our build series. Yes. Um, this is your turn. Yeah. We're just currently working on the editing of a two-part build series, just kind of going into the whys and the mechanics of how we ended up with the Jolene. And so, yeah, we'll kind of dive into the details because the tour video is really more of just the what it is. And yeah, so this is a little bit of a throwback right. to to the old build series of Sun Raider. Right, this right, is the right. modern version. It's gonna be way more professional looking now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it'll be a slightly different format from any of our other videos because it'll be more interview based, driving it rather than voiceover and things like that. So it'll be a little bit different, just playing with different formats. And that's really that's what we got right now. And when can uh, we expect something like that? No pressure. Probably twenty twenty five. At the rate at which we work, um, the title sequence for that is going to be an undertaking for Owen. However, there is a second part that I'm I'm not going to quite talk about yet. Um, that we. Uh, are going to do with that title sequence. Um, so anyways, it's going to be a little bit of an undertaking, but it will, I, I, I would hope like in a month or so that that will start rolling out. Cool. Mm -hmm. We're just Very on a little exciting. break because of the eyeballs. Yeah. Yeah. Those damn eyeballs. Soon, yeah. soon. <laughs> yeah. But that's, I, I would say that's, that's the long and the short of what we can legally talk about at this time. Yeah. yeah. Well, <laughs> Maybe uh, maybe if we had some margaritas and some art twisting, we could have gotten you to say more. <laughs> some I'm onion really rings and some it. French fries. Yeah, I'm hoping really soon, though, we'll be able to like announce some of these other things that we have going on. Well, you know we're ready for it. Yeah. yeah. 
Well, thank you all so much for having us. It was nice seeing you. Obviously, I yeah. wish that we could do this in person, but yeah. this is this is this is good too. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing your story, and uh, it's fun to get to know more details on top of yes. what we already know about you guys and share with yeah. everybody. Oh, thanks, guys. It's an honor. It's an honor. But hopefully, we can see you guys again sometime real soon in person. We love that. Yeah, yeah. It's anything can happen. <laughs> Marlene doesn't want to fly back again, but you know. <laughs> If we have to, Never we have know. to. <laughs> I like to think and hope that we will see you on in the southern hemisphere. I think if that if that if we were within a thousand miles of each other, we would make it happen. We'll make it happen. Yeah. I see. I see you guys in the water surfing with penguins around you, and I'm I'm better at taking video footage now, so a little bit better. <laughs> I mean, if we can Let's make do that. that dream a reality, I would die on sight of there, We, Yeah, we've, we there's saw, people yeah. surfing with penguins yeah. that we yeah. saw. The penguin is not on the board, so don't through. get too excited. Okay, right. No, yeah. this, this is not like the animated sur <laughs> surf suck <Sorry>. sequel. Yeah. <laughs> okay, All cool. right. Thanks again, yeah, guys. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 I hope you guys enjoyed that conversation we had. Is your voice a little sore, Dan? <laughs> Surprisingly, this time, I kind of like this format because mm -hmm. I don't have to do nearly as much talking. <laughs> and if you just like, when you go through the editing process of seeing how this, how this conversation went, mm -hmm. you know, we recorded their track and our track separately. And you can see that there's big blocks of time where I didn't have to say anything, which mm -hmm. is kind of nice. But... You know, I think that's the point of this, the series, mm. is that we want to hear other people's voices. We want to hear how they approach the same problems, the same questions that we have, and how do we somehow, in a roundabout way, like more often than not, come to the same conclusion. Mm. So, and that's why we have so much in common with other people like Mac and Owen who traveled the way we do. So I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you guys have any questions, if you guys have ideas for podcast episodes, or if you guys have people that you'd like us to talk to in this uh, interview podcast series, feel free to email us at podcast at freelyroaming.com. We would love to create more content like this for you guys and talk to the people that you've been dying to hear from. Thanks for listening and watching, and we'll see you next time. See ya.